Hey, good evening, Suki. Good evening, Mia. Yeah. Thank How you are for you? hosting us tonight. Yes, I'm here. I'm not going to be available by uh, video, but I am here. Okay. Pardon the, con uh, the noise <laughs> in my background. Apparently, they're doing construction on the school. Night oh, construction. Wow. They can't do it during the day, so until 11 o'clock every night. Are you up by Medgrover's Prep? Is yeah. Well, no, it's not okay. Medgrover. It's 161. Okay. On Crown. Yeah, Got they're it. doing some type of restoration around the brick. Yeah, but it's like yeah, they seem to be night. doing a lot of work on the school on Parkside too. It, they've had a scaffold up for like two years now. I don't. I don't know what the kids are doing. I don't know. This one went up literally overnight. They had just finished the playground. I thought they were all done. And then the scaffold went up around, I think it's a weatherization project. Okay. I don't know, whatever that means. So that means oh. another six months of noise. Construction. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here. I'll make you co-host it as well. Okay, so sounds good. Just circulated some additional materials for everyone to review. So hopefully everyone will be in shortly. And I'll be right back. Okay, thanks. Hi, Nicholas. Hi, Jay. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Hi, Jay.
Hi, Esteban. Hi, Nicola. Hi, how are you? Uh, so we'll wait up. Oh, John's here. I think we're going to start. Okay. Hi, John. Hi, Suki. It took me a while to get my technology going. Sorry. Oh, well, that's okay. We're just uh, starting now. Okay, good. Um, so uh, it's 7.07. .07. Uh, I'll start the meeting. Um, so I'm going to waive the reading of the rules of order. You all know them, and everyone here is very polite. Um, Okay, so the first order of business, I wanted to address some old business, which was the questions that we came up with for the Department of City Planning. We raised this at the regular ULERP committee meeting, um, but I guess the other committee members were not really ready to vote on this. And it occurred to me that we as a subcommittee should also vote formally to send them. I think we kind of, you know, went through them one by one at the end of the meeting, but we didn't conduct a formal vote. So I'd like to, to do that. Um, I will make a motion to send the, to recommend that we send the Department of City Planning, the questions that we came up with regarding the city of yes, zoning text amendments and i'm going to read them out as i wrote them um and then we can either vote or you guys can have discussion okay so the first question was how much do you plan to decrease the dwelling unit factor for larger multifamily buildings and which zoning categories slash what would be the building size or number of units that this would apply to. And our concern is that District 9 needs family-oriented and family-sized housing as well as housing for singles. Many one to three family homes have already been demolished and replaced by apartment buildings designed for transient singles. Two, how would the text amendments affect CB9 requests for preservation and downzoning throughout our community to prevent unexpectedly large and out of context buildings and demolitions that affect our quality of life and the structural integrity of our homes. Our analysis shows that the zoning amendments would lead to an enormous number of demolitions throughout our district and tens of thousands of new units of housing. Three, how would the text amendments promote equitable development as outlined in the HPD where we live study? Our analysis shows that wealthy white neighborhoods and neighborhoods which have built few or no new units of housing in the last 10 years would be largely unaffected by the zoning amendments because they are mostly landmarked or zoned R1 through R4, while most new housing construction and demolition would take place in minority and lower income areas. Four, for the commercial amendments, what would be the impact on nearby residential housing of removing loading birth requirements in manufacturing districts. What is the scope of this amendment? Five, can you give details about the electric vehicle charging rules and incentives? Six, what incentives will be given to developers over and above the, out zone, the up zonings outlined in the affordable independent residence for seniors schedule in the zoning code? How will FAR height limits and parking limits be changed to facilitate development in lower density commercial districts? Seven, how many transit zones are there which are more than one half mile from a subway station? So I think that reflects the questions that all of you, all of us came up with um, last time. Is there anything that people think that I missed or was misstated? Do we want to ask maybe if there's a timeline for when that information is supposedly going to go out to the different, like to the community boards and everything? Because like I've been asking around and nobody has any idea of like 
what that timeline is or how it's going to be implemented. So like maybe just to give us a heads up as to what we're, what we're, yeah. even, you know, that's, that's a great question. Um, I did see at the last city planning review session, they said that zoning for zero carbon was going to enter ULERP review in April and the commercial amendments would follow a couple of months later and the um, housing portion would probably be the following year. But I think it's good to get all of these things in writing. So I will add that as question number eight. Um, what is the timeline for detailed um, information to be presented to community boards? What is the ULERP timeline? That should also help in the context of CB9 and the ULERP committee because, like, we don't have any sense of that timeline. So I think people are, it's probably, it's probably slower than we think it is. Of, of course it creeps up, but like, I feel like we're, you know, we, we have some, we have some time to figure this stuff out. I just like kind of want to have it on the record that, that we do have that time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Any, any, anybody else? Jay? Yes, um, <clears throat> just uh, uh, just an idea. I don't know if you wanted to, if if, if the committee is open to uh, other ideas on this, is that something where? Sure, like sure. I mean, it's all all of what we have is incorporating. Sure. I hope all of what you guys said last time. Yeah. So, so one thing, maybe one idea would be, will the uh, text amendments be specific to uh, community boards, to community districts? Uh, where instead of it being for the entire city going through a you know where a, a, you know one size fits all for the entire city, could they make it where certain text amendments are have to go through Euler for the individual community district? Sort of like I think like a MIH, where if you want an MIH zone, the community uh, board has to you know specific to it has to uh, do it locally. So this way, instead of them doing a you know. Just saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do this sort of increase in terms of you know for singles and everything like that. If you have a neighborhood like you know Crown Heights or, or East Flatbush, which has a lot of families, you know, they, you know that may be different than a neighborhood like Bushwick, which is or Long Island City. So if they have all of these different various things, could they be more going sort of more towards home rule, you know, towards more locally? Where if you think of certain ideas, if you like it. Uh, you want to expand the commercial zones, you know, do it in neighborhoods that want it, that maybe have that, you know, nightlife, single factor, Long Island City, a story or something like that, you know. So more of a, can it be, can the text amendments, how many of the text amendments would be tailored to community districts? Their answer is going to be none because they want the whole thing to go through, you know, that's, that's their answer, you know, but just to get that idea, can we make it where it's the text amendments are specific to the community district. Like, and, and then another thing would be, can we change things like where, uh, um, where let's say uh, um, the transit zones, can, can we change things where the transit zones could be specific to the community district? You know, where, where it's, I know we, we, we did it before where, where the whole city council did it, but can we make something where the local community decides, hey, if, if I wanna have a transit zone so that you don't need parking, you know, and all of these affordable housing, let the community board say, yeah, we want it, you know? Um, so just that that idea to, to throw that out and, and also maybe something specific on the amount of the, the, the I know you addressed that in the first point, Suki, where you were mentioning about um, the, 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 the dwelling factor, but something specifically saying, if you're gonna build affordable housing, um, specifically say, what's the proportion of studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms? Because if they say, sure, we're gonna do, we'll do studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms, you, you know they'll do it where there'll be like one three bedroom apartment and there'll be like 900 studios. So can we have specific uh, uh, um, amounts that, that equitably, fairly and equitably reflect uh, the census in terms of different data that says, okay, you know, there's 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 22 percent of New York City is 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 three three bedroom households is is four person or more. So can can we can we match fairly and equitably 
uh, and say we're going to have this amount of three bedroom apartments specifically as, as an affordable housing minimum. Okay. Thanks. Okay, okay. so um, I will add Jay's question um, about the mix of bedrooms to the first question about the dwelling unit factors. And I'll add your second question about the transit zones um, to the other transit zone question. Um, so question seven, we'll read how many transit zones are there which are more than one half mile from a subway station? Can communities decide to opt out of a trend out of the transit zone. Does that sound fair? And then yeah. question one, um, I would say, okay, at the end of the question, I would add the following, um, uh, can zoning prescribe the mix of bedroom units for affordable housing. And I suspect the answer would be if it's an MIH zone, then they would be able to do that. I'm I'm not sure how the dwelling unit factor controls that directly. Um, and then for your on, um, on that point, I thought they were trying to get rid of the regulation altogether so that developers could build if they wanted to build a build have a building that was a hundred percent studios, they would be able to do that. They could do that. That would be a good question. Um, you know, hopefully if they answer that question about how much they intend to decrease the dwelling unit factor. If the answer comes back that we plan to eliminate it, that 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 would be our our answer. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody has asked these questions directly before. Um, and then for Maybe. question okay. nine, um, to Jay's point, my, we would just add: Will text amendments apply to specific community districts? And that would actually introduce a different process, which is not a ULERP process per se. Um, in that case, there would be a public hearing for those communities that are affected, but it, it might not be required to be at the community board. Um, and then I think there's a rule that kicks in about um, if you petition all the property owners in the vicinity, it, you can require a supermajority of the council to pass it, yada, yada, yada. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure how helpful it is. T typically, when you want specific rules to apply to specific communities, that's what this, the neighborhood rezoning process is, is for. But we can certainly ask that that question. You may want to like frame at least part of that as I, I I realize that they've kind of tried to skirt around the the concept of a comprehensive plan and like to use those actual terms because they got such a like such pushback last year um, yeah. when they tried to do it. And so, but I think that's what these questions uh, that Jay's bringing up get to like like are you guys actually just thinking of doing like a blanket policy that's going to cover all of us and you know not be nuanced at all. Um, at least we can get them on the record as saying that. So if, if we can maybe even use the term comprehensive plan somewhere in that, um, and that way we're, I think, I mean, this is really just like a, a fact-finding mission, right? Like we're trying to, yeah. trying to figure out like what yeah. we're working with. So What are they um, up to? Exactly. Yeah, whatever we can get on the record, I think we should try to do. They may not okay. answer so how it, but, you know. How do you want to phrase this? Can you propose something, Esteban, if I say, will text amendments apply to specific community districts or... You know how give give me a give me a phrasing. Um, will text amendments be incorporated into a comprehensive plan, or will community districts be 
I don't know, however uh, Jay put it, like, uh, you know, handled individually or however you want to do that. Um, can't really think of the language right now because I'd have to write it out. But, um, but yeah, just say, asking if the text amendments are, if they're planning on the text amendments being part of a comprehensive plan, that would apply to, uh, to every district. Okay, so will text amendments be incorporated into a comprehensive land use plan for the whole city, or will individual community districts be uh, what be incorporating these, um, or will individual community districts be making decisions on these, or be making yeah. decisions? Okay. All right. So, um, does anybody want me to read these over again before we vote? Jay? Just to add one, just other point on it in terms okay. of like questions to ask. Uh, if, if we could ask maybe um, instead of will this, will this be on like a certain basis where each community board has its own right, they're going to say no. Can, can we say something different where can the community districts uh, uh, have like an opt-in basis, like something where some sort of phrasing saying like, can, it, can the text amendments be uh, community district specific on an opt-in basis? And my understanding is, I think when it, when, when you have like, uh, and I'm not sure if anybody on the committee knows, uh, may, maybe uh, maybe John John knows also because he seems like he has expertise, but are, are the inclusionary zones, when you have either an inclusionary zone or an MIH zone, isn't that where they, they had rules passed across the board and they just said, okay, if you want it, each community district can do it. Is, is that how, my understanding was, is that how it works? So the yeah. text amendment applied to the entire city, right? That, that was essentially the legislation that enabled this right. at all and that created new types of zones, but it was up to each community district to right. map them where right. they wanted to. That's it, that's it. Although- And you also had to be rezoned for MIH. Yes. You had to have, it had to be an area that was already down zoned. So for community board nine, it was Franklin Avenue. That's the only part of our district that had down zoned. So it had to have the A, 6A, 7A. So it well, was- no, Nicola, that's not, that's not true. It can be mapped absolutely anywhere. And I would, it's likely that if they mapped it, they would have made it a contextual zone, but it would have been a much higher density contextual zone. They could have done it absolutely anywhere. The fact that they chose to do it on Franklin Avenue was because those developers wanted it. That that's that was really one of the big problems is that it wasn't just up to communities to come forward and say, we want it here and here, not here and there. Right. They basically allowed any developer or property owner to make a proposal for their site. And then we would have to react to that. I, I was under the understanding that it had to be an area that was already rezoned, nope. which is no. why. So. So the only Not area whatsoever. out of all of CB9 that got a developer's interest was Franklin Avenue. Not whatsoever, no. It can be absolutely anywhere, including a non-residential zone. Any property owner can come forward and ask for a rezoning. And there's actually nothing in the code that says you cannot have a rezoning without <clears throat> doing affordable housing. That's That was simply the past administration's, and I think this administration's policy. Basically, I, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but basically the code says, we will not do an MIH zoning without a significant upzoning and density, but nowhere does it says, say, we will not give you an upzoning without MIH. That's just, that's a matter of policy. Yeah. Yeah, they can choose not to do that. Um, they can, yeah, any, you can rezone anywhere, but in order to get MIH, 
I thought that had to already be an area that had some no. uh, protections. Not whatsoever. There is guidance okay. that's, that says we will not do an MIH zone except in areas where the city intends to significantly upzone for more density. So like, for example, they're not going to do an MIH zone with a 10% increase in density. I think at first some people thought that would be possible and the code says, no, we won't do that. But it does not say anything whatsoever to link no. Okay. Jay, what yeah. what did you want to? I, I just wanted to add, just so you're you're specific, so you you understand like the the, the question where it's it has to go through the community board to pass this because like if if what what they seem like what they want to do is they want to. Uh, almost like increase the density to upzone different things. Like this, this mayor, De Blas, mayor uh, Adams plan talks about. Uh, you know, we want to have more supportive housing in it. We want to have more for singles. We want to do this much more for the commercial. So my concern is that okay, you don't want a certain block being made into something different. Give have that more local control and saying, listen, uh, we want this to go through uh, another step where it's not automatic. Where if somebody buys a property there, they could build with this increased amount of, uh, uh, of, of, of units, uh, make it specific where it's got to be passed by the community board on, on a local Euler level, you know, where it has to go through it. Similar to, do we want an MIH zone on Franklin? And then the whole community came out and said, okay, you know, we don't want it there, you know? Um, yeah. And, and that's exactly, that was exactly the debate that happened over ZQA as well, that it would have allowed up zonings virtually everywhere as opposed to neighborhoods deciding how they wanted to rezone. So yeah, that's just an, sort of an ongoing an ongoing thing. Um, okay, are we are we ready to to vote? Should I read these again? We can vote, but I, um, that's just, just because I just heard it. <laughs> what? Just because I just heard it. <laughs> but uh, if somebody, if people want that, them read back, I, that's cool with you. I'm, I'm cool with you there. Okay. Um, Nicola, John, what do you want us to do? Sure. Um, I'm, not, not, not sorry. Go ahead, Nicola. No, I was going to say, I think we can vote on it. Um, but then we also need to talk about how we prep the broader ULERP committee, because they're not just going to take a list of questions and vote on it with no background. That's right. the problem that Pat has. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, at this point, she has the minutes for our last meeting, um, and we'll send these questions to her again. I mean, I think we should send it to everyone, basically. Um, and that's, that's that. I mean, certainly anybody can, can ask questions of city planning as a, as a resident of CB9, um, you know, but, but it's good for them to know what our district's specific concerns are. Jay. Yeah. Um, I, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be asking too, too many questions. I hope that Somebody didn't spike my my fruit cup with extra sugar or caffeine. Um, but la last question will be very brief. Uh, okay. Is it possible because a large amount of this deals with uh, an increase in supportive housing um, and for for different populations of homeless, uh, mentally drug addicts, people who, who need help and everything? Part part of it where the, the mayor said we want more supportive housing in, in in the guidelines. Can we have a residential beds analysis? Uh, by district. They did this maybe 10, 15 years ago. There's lists out there, there's data out there where it's, it's, there's a residential beds analysis that, that's given per, uh, uh, per district that says how many homeless beds are there in this district, in that district, in, in every one. So a shelter I is a think, Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely something that we should do at, as a ULERP committee. You might want to bring that to the ULERP committee um, or the housing committee. 
um, I, it, it's not, you know, we'd just be speculating whether or not City of Yes is, is about building certain types of housing. They've, they've been very vague about that. They've really only said affordable housing. Because in the blueprints, in the blueprints, I think there's language that says uh, we're going to have an increase in housing for the homeless. So in terms of that concept, uh, that send, send that link to us because I, I feel yeah. like it says inclusionary housing, um, including supportive housing. And, you know, I mean, we we know what they want, but we, you know, there's nothing there, there's nothing out there that says this is this is what it's for, uh, unless I'm wrong, but send us the link. Yeah. He, 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 he has something in there, like Mayor Adams has something saying, I want more studios and single and single bed and single bedroom apartments. So as soon as he has that in there, yeah. I know what the text amendment is going to be. My concern is there. And he also has something in there, oh, no. uh, more supportive housing. So oh, as a corollary for that, yeah. I would say if you yes. want more supportive housing, oh, I'm sorry. I try and make time for follow. I guess send, send us the link, Jay, no and, and, and we'll see what no we can way. take out of it. Okay. I mean, no way. No way. Okay, so are we ready to vote? I gotta just um, make a quick comment on that. I, yes. Uh, one thing that, that boy. you probably mm. notice as this goes along is um, uh, the city and developers don't really want to build supportive housing. Yeah. There's no, there's not really any money in that. That's more of like a, a political priority that they that they put out there. But like Eric Adams would be perfectly fine with oh, no supportive sorry. housing. Adam, can you mute yourself? Uh, yeah, the the city would be fine with that happening. In fact, it's always like an uphill battle to get any supportive housing built. Um, because when you look at like the stuff that we're looking at right now is purely for the purpose of making things easier for developers to make money. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't pay attention to it, but uh, maybe a, a, that can assuage your fears a little bit that like the, it's always the last thing to get to get dealt with. And it's always a, like a really, really minuscule number of units. Um, it really is just for the purpose of being able to like uh, score some sort of a political win and make promises of a, um, supportive housing but the way that it works is very different than than like something like mih like it's a whole like it's like building a clinic into a into a a, a development so like it's uh i'm less concerned about that in terms of 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 uh what they're going to build and i would be more concerned really about like shelters themselves as opposed to su supportive housing because shelters are very profitable um no matter they're always profitable like they're no matter what like no matter how many beds or whatever, like shelters are always going to be profitable for the for the people administering them. Usually, uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, family who owns most of the shelters. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so like that's uh, it's a good thing to keep track of um, the yeah. supportive housing. But I just I I think that that it's uh, it's unlikely that that as part of this this push right here for the city of yes stuff that they're gonna. They're going to put too much effort into that because the developers don't want that. That's the last thing they want in their in their you know in their I, units. I, I would I would just I would you know just disagree on certain things. That with the supportive housing, you you, you can look at 681 Clarkson, where they're building like a thousand units. Um, a tremendous amount of them are supportive housing, and what they've recently done is is they've changed the amount of money that they pay developers for a lot of the supportive housing, whose target population is mostly homeless, mentally ill, drug addicts. It's the same population. Uh, supportive housing is, is pretty much in a, in a lot of situations in most it's basically like a um, you know a, a designer label for a, for a homeless shelter if, if you take a person from a homeless shelter and then you take them out two weeks later uh, you put them in supportive housing they're the formerly homeless or the chronically homeless so they're and now the supportive housing has a track record that's way 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 different than what a shelter track so record is it's, it's permanent this... it's, it's permanent housing and it's uh, the reason that the reason I, that I say it is because I don't want to give the impression that we as a as a committee are coming out against supportive housing because I think that uh like I've seen how it I've seen how it works. It's um like it's infinitely preferable to have somebody that's gonna be in stationary in a permanent home with services like that than a shelter or even like transient like market rate housing. Like it's uh it can actually be beneficial. It has to be done right. And so like I I get some of your concerns, but I don't want to like I don't want to put anything out from our from our end, that makes it seem like we're against that. Just you know, we can 
be concerned, but like, you know, I just, I want to make sure that we're not, Nicola, Nicola, what, what you have your hand raised. I'm, I'm just trying to clarify if Jay is looking for current state information versus, um, you know, where, where they're intending to go with some of the new developments. I'm wondering if uh, I know that um, Borough President Reynoso put together um, a current state analysis for Brooklyn that covered a number of different demographic areas. And I'm wondering if that might have had, I was trying to find the, the deck, if that might have some of the supportive housing statistics in it. By yeah, that's a very good board. that's a very good thought that that's something we could propose to the borough president. I mm -hmm. don't believe I did see that, but let's check and we can raise that with the borough president. And that might be a better place to do that. I think I think the issue is it's clearly important, but it's a little bit it's kind of beyond our our subcommittee charge at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um so ready to vote? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to call the roll. Uh, Suki Chiang, yes. Nicola Cox. Nicola? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, I'm Esteban? Yes. Uh, and John? Yes. Okay. Thank you, everybody. So now we can move on to the new stuff. Um, so we were going to talk about the BLAST amendments, and Nicola put together a very nice presentation. Thank you, Nicola. Um, do, do you want to do you want to take it from here, Nicola? Because there were certain amendments. These were basically amendments to the seeker process, the environmental review process, the um, DOB permitting process. Um, how a lot of these agencies that are related to building construction work. And some of them required ULERP, which is our committee. Um, so I asked Nicola to pull those out and look at those. Do, do you want to um, give us your, your report on that, Nicola? Did everybody get a chance to read it, by the way? I'm trying to find the link to it now. I read it, but I don't have it in front of me. Okay, Nicola, why don't you just give us a, a, a summary and then we can discuss them. Right, it's been a while since I'm, I'm trying to look at it myself. It's been <laughs> okay. a while since I did this. Um, I mean, my when I looked at the items that they had listed for Euler consideration, they were very getting down into the weeds of details to me, and I'm sure that there are going to be other broader um, amendments coming through that will require some type of review that we're not seeing yet. Um, the, the first one, so it's like a little tic-tac-y, expand mechanisms such as designations for additional action types was the first one. And it's, it was basically focused on the fact that um, when you're making a zoning resolution, you have to ensure that potential hazardous materials, air quality, noise impacts, um, that could be basically um, environmental remediation process uh, is considered. And uh, this was basically saying that there's some zoning actions that are undertaken in which these items are not um, part of the process. And so they want to get that added in in consultation with DOB um, and other agencies to make sure that they are allowing non-zoning actions such as text, um, if you're demapping, city mapping amendments, um, property dispositions and other potential um, impact areas are also considered in terms of um, impacts that they may have on the area. So that was the first item, number 36. Um, number 58, right size discretionary review processes that do not benefit from extensive feedback. Um, let me see what this was.
again, specifying, simplifying the design process for privately owned public spaces. I think this is related to um, when I read this one. So basically they wanna simplify the process. And if you remember um, with the armory, the developer had to come and present to the community board a few times. They wanted, they had the design for their rooftop garden and other items. And they, it was part of the process that they needed to present it to the community board, but we really had no say. So I think they want to take a look at some of those requirements for these, this prop, privately owned public land now um, to make public, privately owned public spaces. And, and I think this is again related to um, taking a look at where some of the redundant um, processes may be in effect. Um, number 59, special permits for energy efficient efficiency projects. This seemed to be um, more related again to the carbon neutrality text amendment and the storage of batteries within the city. And I think you actually had some other document. I think this is a bigger issue than Euler because um, as we've all talked about, there have been a number of issues related to batteries and battery storage, but this was a text amendment to allow battery storage to take place within a residential area and, and uh, amend the building code to provide that. Right, to allow it as of right without the special permit. Exactly. And the last one is related to number 60, land acquisition of inland flood prone properties for blue belts and cloud bursts of, and new parkland. Again, very detailed, very specific. Um, I think it would, we would need more information on specifically where the blue belt and, and, um, and cloud burst areas are. But um, again, it's related to um, changes that they wanna make within parks and specific areas of the city. So again, all of these amendments that they highlighted in this document are very detailed. And I'm sure that they're higher level ULERP related issues that are more broad based, um, wide sweeping changes and impacts that are not being highlighted right now. What they tended to do to me was get way down into the weeds so that people's eyes would glaze over and just keep it moving, just put it as an item, another list in their blast document, but not really highlighting the major impacts that may exist. Is that your dog or is that a cat? Yeah, sorry. Okay, I'm just seeing the top. So. <laughs> So yeah, I was surprised when I saw that list of ULERP items that those were the only items that were listed as requiring ULERP review, because I know that there are gonna be more coming. But they, again, they wanna highlight the detailed minutia and not really allow us to focus on some of the broader based uh, impact areas. That's yeah. my, that's I, my. I, I, I think, you know, there's concern about what might require ULR approval that they haven't said requires ULR approval. Because exactly. a lot of these changes are pretty pretty sweeping. Anybody else have any comments on any of these that we pulled out? Anybody? Esteban, John? There's Anybody? not much to comment upon right now, because again, yeah. it's so detailed that we have to actually see what changes, what specific changes are they looking at and considering. Um, and we know that, again, there are major items that are gonna be coming our way that will require ULERP, but they don't want to bring attention to those right now. So I actually did have something along the lines of comments or questions for these. Um, if if you guys are willing to um, let me speak for a few minutes, I can mm -hmm. I can 
say what they are. Um, okay, so let me see, I, I made comments to the presentation. Okay, so for adding the E designations, the E designations are actually uh, an important thing that it, in, in our community, we have a lot of sites, particularly around Empire Boulevard, I think Teresa can tell you, that have some contamination. There was one on Troy and Carroll that came up um, as, a, as a variance request because they had environmental contamination. So it's a good thing to have an e-designation because it, it, make, it requires cleanup. Um, the question is, why are they proposing this change and, and, and what's going to be the consequence? And it looks like what they're saying is currently e-designations are only available when a zoning action is undertaken. But what they want to do is allow non-zoning actions such as map amendments or property dispositions to allow the e-designation um, during that process. And I guess my question is, if you're doing it under the map amendment process or the property disposition process, are you still going through ULERP? Is it still a public process where we can see what's happening? Because I never really like it when you remove public review. You know, although it may help get an e-designation faster, uh, you know, what happens if they use this same process to remove e-designations? What happens if somebody like somebody from our committee, like Teresa, asks for an e-designation for a particular site and it isn't done? Are we going to have any transparency into what these agencies are doing and any say? So that, that's what I would say about that. Um, for the second one, right-size discretionary review processes that don't benefit for, from extensive feedback. And they're saying that some of these special permits are redundant, like the FAA airport glide path certification. That's, I think what that is, is, you know, if you're very close to an airport, buildings can't be taller than a certain height because you're in the, um, the glide path. And um, establishing as of right status for da data transmission towers. I mean, my concern with them saying, oh, this is redundant because we have other regulations. So FAA and FCC, which is Federal Communications Commission rules, those are federal rules. Zoning rules are city law. The city has the power to make less permissive rules than the federal government. So it's really not the same thing. I, I don't think it's redundant. Um, just my thought, we have a cell data transmission tower in our community. Some of you know that it, it's, it's up on, um, you know, you can see it from Washington Avenue up near the Botanic Gardens. It's, it's huge. And they do have an environmental impact. I, you know, if, if you're talking about uh, establishing them as a right, I'm, you know, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, okay. Are you talking about it on top of a building or? Uh, no, it's there. We have, I mean, I don't, I don't, I think it's actually a radio transmission tower for emergency services, but you know, it's this huge kind of like Eiffel tower like thing that you you can see often. Um, you know, which one I'm talking about, right? It's, it's, it's yeah, just it's north part of the fire department. It's an FDNY yeah. site on, that's on empire between Franklin and Washington. Uh, gotcha. McKeever. So, yeah, I'm not sure what data it. transmission towers they're talking about. It, if they're talking about cell phone towers, I mean, those are those are needed. But Solid. no, it's Yeah, sorry. You know, I I think all this kind of siting is supposed to go through the Euler process, and uh, I I don't want to take away public review. I I, I don't think there's anything. Um, you know, considering all of the considering all of the um, agitation there's been about the five G link towers, um, you know, if you're talking about something potentially much bigger, it, I think it's that amazing. It, it's amazing what they are able to get away with. The building across the street from me has like you can't go into the into the roof, 
like there's like these like like do not enter because it's like literally hazardous and like uh it's cracking like the 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 ceilings of all the people that live on the fifth floor and like it's uh causing all sorts of like people think they're getting sick from it like it's really bad and like it they can anybody can do it any landlord can do it without really any sort of oversight uh and, and like these are people. the um the cell phone transmission equipment yeah. Yeah, and then Verizon and other companies pay the landlord rent for putting their stuff there. So, right, right. It's uh, I I went over there and I was like, I can't believe this is like it. It looked like a like a sci-fi movie. Like like you literally can't go up there because there's too much radiation. Like it's wow. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. I yeah. I I think there are some questions about the health effects of of the radiation. Um you know, we, we need some form of data transmission, but should it be as a right or should we be able to consider it? Um, yeah, the 5G towers did not go through the uh, community board at all. And those no, have they the capacity. did not, and they, and they should have. They should Yeah, have. and they have the capacity to hold um, four, four, like, I guess call them cells for different cell phone companies. And they'll be they'll be leased out by the company that put those up. So it's like a private use of public space with this, I guess, environmental hazard potentially. And I know on the um, Upper East Side they've been able to remove them, have them taken out. Well, the angle the angle that I think might be helpful is just like a, an aside, but um, the structural damage that it's doing to the buildings, like like I've been in people's apartments and you see the cracks coming in. Oh, where Jesus. they've like secured those to the to from the, the top from yeah the top? yeah oh i mean like oh, come, yeah. like they're coming literally like it, it happens it's been happening systematically at um oh, my. Re report, at 990 president report to hpd i i that we we can't you know have an extensive discussion about this in this meeting but please report to hpd <laughs> yeah no it's 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 bad it's real bad <laughs> Um, but yes, I, I I think that the 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 five G issue is something else that Euler should consider as well because it's a franchise and um, franchises normally go through Euler. All right, so the next thing, um, so but but as far as you know, allowing these things to be as of right, I I think no. Um, Okay, battery storage. I guess I didn't read it that way that they were now proposing that this would all be as of right. I thought they were looking to try and streamline and standardize some of the processes. Did I misread uh, it? That, that, that's that's what they're saying. They're saying that they want data transmission towers to be as of right. I, I'm reading it right there. Oh, that, as, oh the bottom, yeah. Mm -hmm. Establish as of right status for da data transmission tower. For data tower. transmission tower for that specific right. and item. And as far as yeah. the redundancy of the regulations, um, I, I don't think they're redundant because one is a federal rule and one is a city rule. And they should, you know, mm -hmm. they should kind of track each other, but it's, it's entirely possible for the city to have more restrictive rules than the federal government, and that's our choice. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, um, um, can I just um, make yeah, a point? Alicia. Like, there's a discussion of whether or not these things need to go through Europe or they are just going to be administrative decisions. One of the things I did have an attorney look at the 111 um, proposals, okay. and he basically said that they were pretty accurate. If you if you look at the 111 proposals, you'll see at the top of each proposal who will be responsible and whether it's going to be a ULIP process or it's just going to be an administrative process. And he said, okay. for the most part, when he looked at those things, they were accurate. So okay. if you are looking at proposals where it clearly says that it's just going to be an administrative process, but they're going to make the changes administratively, they will there will be no community review. There will be no ULIP even though you might want to have that happen, it's not going to happen. And so I think um, that needs to be clear because you can complain about a lot of things, um, but if it has no community review, it's just going to be an administrative change and you really don't have any legal recourse to challenge it because they're going to come up with a rationale. There's, they're the experts and that's the way it's going to happen. So 
um, my, you know, I, I'm not an expert on this, but my take on this is that's what the um, Article 78 is for, to challenge agency actions. <laughs> and the standard, it normally, for whether this can be simply an agency action or whether there has to be legislative action, is whether it's what's known as ministerial. If it's ministerial, meaning that it's really not a big change, it doesn't change the intention of the underlying law, then they can just go ahead and do it. Um, but if it's actually, a, it represents a major change to the intention of the underlying law, you can, you can certainly sue to require that. Well, some of them are not laws, that's the point. Some of them are just policy and regulation and regulations. They're not necessarily a body of law sitting somewhere. And that's the point. That's why, for example, the seeker, the seeker is not a body of law, it's just a manual. And so because it's a manual, they can update it and they can change the seeker. And you cannot do an Article 78. You, if you want to, you can do an Article 78, but it's going to get thrown out because it's not a body of law. It's just so a my, my understanding is Seeker is, is designed to keep us in compliance with Seeker, which is the state right. environmental quality review. That's right. But it's a so manual. The, it's not a regulation. So that, a that's something that you need to look at as well, whether any of these changes would end up violating the state law, because that wouldn't be allowed, right? Well, then that would, right, because then if, if, if that was the case, then the review itself would then state that it would have to go through state review. That's, again, right. if you look at what they say needs to happen, according to the attorney who's pretty much of an expert in this area, he's basically saying they were very correct. If it is required state, then you have the state review. If it's changing the state requirements, then fine, you have to go through the state. But some of them don't, and some of them are administrative. And because they are administrative, they can do it, and they do not have to have a public review on administrative actions, um, whether so they... Having Alicia, can you still um you can still challenge based on like the the arbitrary and capricious doctrine, right? Um, if yeah, they, but like, you guys, you, you know how many people what? how many people have filed Article seventy eight about an administrative review process that's arbitrary yeah. and capricious yeah. when the city constantly states that they are the experts and the courts constantly say it's that a, they are. It's the a very experts. high bar. Right. It's a difficult yeah. standard. Yeah, but it's in this case, impossible. this is something. This is something that they did note as requiring a ULIP review. What, yes. uh, what Suki is, she's concerned about one of the changes that they wanna make as part of this, um, in which they wanna make the um, established as of right status for da data transmission towers as part of this change. I know, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't specifically talking about that particular um, um, proposal. What I was saying that there was a question of whether or not some proposals require reviews and the others don't. And I was saying that if you look at the 111 proposals, it kind of it will give you a very good framework of what will require you look review and what will not. So maybe it's it's if you want to narrow down the 111, you might want to consider looking at the ones that will have a public review process because those are when you can actually weigh in on those. Yeah, topics. there will be some that require legislative review. There are some where the agency pro rulemaking process itself requires a public hearing. And um, in, in fact, that that might, if somebody wants to volunteer to highlight those and send them to Dante so that Dante can send them out to the public if and when there is actually a public hearing so that we can have whatever say we can have for what difference that makes, um, that would be extremely helpful. Um, and we may, you know, we can continue to talk about this next time as well, um, but we, you know, we probably have a little bit more work to do before we can talk about those. But so just to, to get to the last one, um, so, so the next, so removing special permits for the energy efficiency projects. I guess we'll get to this when we talk about um, battery storage. Um, and then finally, pursuing land acquisition for inland flood prone properties, blue belts, and new parkland. This is one of those things that sounds like a very friendly thing, 
Um, but I, I, I think if you, you know, this really should be part of a more holistic process. I, I, I don't think that large scale acquisitions of land should be done by individual city agencies. It should be done as part of a neighborhood wide or district wide land use planning process that considers all of the needs of the community. I mean, just as we wouldn't necessarily want HBD to come in and say, we're designating a whole bunch of MIH areas without considering our needs for parkland or other things. I don't think you necessarily want DEP or parks to come in and say, well, this is our decision independent of, you know, whatever other needs the community might have. The second thing I think as Nicholas said, is we need to understand which communities are going to be affected by this because historically the communities that have tended to be able to use these types of special designations and special processes are places like Staten Island, which has a lot of wet, you know, wet, a lot of area designated as wetlands, a lot of area designated as special natural area district. Um, like there's probably some parts of the Bronx that you know have this kind of special designation. And consequently, you have vast amounts of land that are just exempted from all of the things that you know Jay's talking about, you know, that the rest of us cry and moan about. <laughs> um, and is this part of a comprehensive, as Esteban says, that considers the city's needs, it considers, you know all needs. So I, you know, I, I, I would hesitate to say that this should be done outside of a more holistic process. That's my opinion. Anybody, anybody else? Any thoughts about that? I'm kind of frozen here. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Do yes. We, are we ready to make any recommendations on these? Um, I think Jay has a question or no? Okay. Are, are we ready to make any recommendations on these to the ULERP committee or should we wait and look at the other stuff? what would we be recommending i'm not sure because that to me it was just an fyi these are some of the things to have okay. on our radar there's nothing to okay. recommend at this point okay so um let's let's move on then to talk about the um zoning for zero carbon um did everybody get a chance to see the city planning commission review no okay um, so they basically, they, they gave a few more examples, I think, than what they gave to us in the public information session. And um, basically it breaks down into five different areas. There was battery storage, rooftop solar, facades, EV charging, and street trees. Um, is it worth going through this? Is does does everybody, uh, you know, ha, has has have people reviewed this enough for this to be worth going through? I have not had a chance to look, take a look at this part. Okay, I'm, I looked but at I it. Follow along. <laughs> yeah, I looked at it before the last meeting, but um, I mean, if we, if we can keep this very high level, okay, um, you know, this is a very you know, three sentence summary for each of the topics. Okay. And it's very high level. Okay. Um, okay, so why don't we start with battery storage? Because I, I, I think that's kind of an important issue because it involves basically what they want to do is these big, um, solar panels. The sun doesn't shine every day, but you might produce more electricity on the days when it does shine. 
that you can't necessarily use and you'd like to be able to save it for a rainy day. So you can either sell it back to the grid, back to Con Ed, or you can store it on your own batteries and use it for, you know, at a later date. And it, it is actually, you do actually need, in, in a climate like New York City, where the sun obviously doesn't shine every day, um, it, it is kind of needed to make solar power effective and reduce the cost of electrification. It's, you know, using electricity instead of gas to heat your house is, is very expensive and solar panels are a way to kind of lower that cost. But solar panels are not really effective unless you can have battery storage. So the proposal is to allow these big batteries um, on building rooftops um, as of right, I guess. Uh, it, it, they, they haven't proposed specific rules about how many, you know, if there'll be size limits, weight limits, um, what type of batteries. Again, we're not getting a lot of specifics, just saying we want to make it easier. We don't want the code to prevent this. But, but you know, we've also seen cases where these lithium ion e-bike batteries, it's, it's basically the same type of battery, but used in a different context, um, have caught fire. And there's definitely heightened concern about fire safety in our community. We had big fire at 80 Clarkson, had another fire just north, just around the corner from me. Every winter there's electrical fires. I'm not saying that they're due to batteries, um, but you know, I, I, I think safety is kind of paramount. So, uh, you know, the question, and, and there was a building owner in Williamsburg who proposed to cover the rooftop with these big batteries and the tenants were extremely worried that it wasn't going to be safe. So I think the question is what is, what is safe, right? Um, John, did, did you have? Um, yeah, I, I think we have to be careful not to uh, conflate a cheap secondhand um, moped battery that some that has been around for 10 years and been is damaged and it's not a uh, high quality bat battery to start with with these types of systems it be it would be saying yeah you know, i mean it's they're very different things right they have some overlap in technology and components but they are vastly different things so we have to be very i think you have to be careful about conflating those it would be saying uh, there was a, you know, a car blew up or it went caught fire, so we shouldn't have cars anywhere. So it's like, it's making that same comparison. I've seen car fires in New York City. So by that, you know, we have to be careful not to say, because there was a car fire, we can't have cars. Yeah, so, I mean, these, so these lithium ion batteries are yeah, there's, everywhere. There's been a couple instances tonight where very different things are being put together as being like the same thing. So I think we had to be careful and know what we're, exactly what we're talking about and speak, you know, be truthful. And I heard, you know, can't say I heard something would become like, we become like Republicans and whatever conspiracy theory we think yeah. about is that becomes the operating uh, way forward. So we have to be very careful about that. So I have, I live in a house that is all electric and I have 12 solar panels on my roof and we've made it through the winter and we do it every year. And yeah, we, we don't have battery storage. We rely, we have Con Ed connection uh, for the power that we need, you know, for, you know, we still get most of our power through Con Ed. Um, I think my understanding is the, for these battery systems is basically creating a micro grid, like a local grid for, solar energy production that would then be able to distribute, you know, store it and then distribute it out locally either to the building or within a small network within around these areas. So they're very different, you know, very different things. So it's, it's like an industrial scale solar production and storage. So, so just, so I have personal experience, 
And I think for the most part in New York City, you're always going to be connected to the grid. You know, we're not in the, the wilds of Montana or the Adirondacks and running, you know, a, a couple lights. No. So we might actually just be talking about a handful of building owners who want to do this. And, right. you know, I, I, I think that it can be a, a good thing for communities, but obviously part of the motivation is it's a moneymaker for some of these building owners. And that's just, unfortunately, as you know, as much as it might it pains me and all of us, you know, probably a number of us, we live in a capitalist society. Yes. And that is how you know, we talked earlier about developers and developers will build buildings not out of the goodness of their heart, but out of you know the need to fatten their wallet. So, so that's how that works. And we just need, you know, generally we want to be able to may not yeah. limit, but control that things are not always just to the benefit of the developer, not always to the benefit of the landowner, but we take in uh, account community and our neighborhoods and the greater good of the city. Yeah, so I, I, I think it's actually a very important concern for environmental justice that we make sure that these are safe for the tenants who happen to be living in those buildings who don't have a choice about whether whether or not this goes up um because you know that it's very likely to happen in lower income lower rent communities where the landlord is looking for other ways to um earn some income and you know so although it's a matter of environmental justice to shut down dirty peaker plants it's also a matter of environmental justice whether certain buildings are going to end up with an industrial scale battery storage on their roof so that, or, that's or we could be like harlem and end up with a truck stop instead of residential housing i mean which was you know there's a whole bunch of insanity that and like weirdness that happened with that project in harlem if you know about that one with the they just brought it back actually um but yeah that's not figure when they they brought it back, but they brought it back and they're starting at a 50% uh, affordable. Do they? Uh, yeah, that's a starting point. So it makes you wonder if that if that uh if that whole process and that uh and the council member just like saying no, uh like they're gonna get a ton more affordable housing than than they would have gotten otherwise. So like I thought they were already I thought they were 50 or even 60 percent before that with their no, I mean that's well, yeah, that's the starting. So that Andrew, now they're starting. Do you have that, a now. comment about the battery storage? I mean, I do. I do want to. I, I want to hear about people's thoughts like on CRJ or KRJ as well. But I, I think that also putting this within the context of how New York City and New York State are able to get energy is also quite important when you're talking about you know those poor tenants who live in rental buildings. Like I would love to have solar power on my building, but that's not my choice as a tenant. I grew up in a building in Philly where you know, the apartment had solar power. And I think there was battery storage in the basement in the transformer room because we were selling to the grid. But I, I don't want to say that it's a get rich quick scheme because the way that Con Ed has kind of established the way that solar energy units can be bought and sold is that instead of the retail market that they charge you, you have to you sell them back at the wholesale market. And that's something that New York State has not done a really good job of advocating for. So it, like on one hand, yeah, like, you don't get very much for selling it back to the grid because you, you're still charged. Yes. The, um, if anything, I think in the future, as we continue oh, sure. to like decommission nuclear plants upstate and continue to have really bad bargaining with a lot of the hydropower from Quebec that supplies us with our energy, alternative means are going to be more beneficial for, for like lower income working class people. Does that make sense? Like as electricity from the general like the general processes of creation becomes more expensive to bring to New York City. I think this is like not a greedy developer driven thing. I think it makes a lot of sense economically as well as, you know, it could be an environmental or social justice initiative. But I think the siting of the batteries is significant, not that necessarily having them on the roof is good or bad. I'm confused why they wouldn't be in the Con Ed vaults that are in the basement of most buildings. That's an interesting that's where thought. The and and, and we garages. also have it's cars. You'd have to lose all your car or a good number of your car parking. And we can't have that because we need our well, I mean, there's a lot of, there's there's a lot of buildings that don't 
actually have underground yeah. you know the older buildings don't have underground parking right they not um, yeah. like, but i was going to say that's basically I, I, I was going to say that's an interesting thought because that does bring up what are what are the right safety regulations to have around this? Like when we ha have gas boilers, there are rules about needing to about the boiler needing to be enclosed um, in a room with fireproof fire rated material. So do we have do we have similar regulations around battery storage? And I think we have yet to see the fire code and the safety code that goes along with these zoning changes. Yeah, I think that's something that ULIP could ultimately, even if it's not explicitly stated, be a part of saying like, we would prefer that a, a new development or even a, a large renovation place these batteries smartly so that if you're doing a renovation on an existing building, batteries are very, very heavy and you're not increasing the dead load of the building that would maybe compromise the sort of structural integrity, especially if you're you know, increasing the density of the units within. Does that make sense? Like to, yeah. to kind of have a structural and then economic yeah. analysis to say like, we want these in a three hour fire rated chase in the basement because we know you have that space already. Yeah. And that way more than it could be usable for tenants too, who knows? Nicola? Uh, um, question, a couple items in terms of the placement of the battery. I wonder if part of the consideration is some of the flooding that we've had related to Sandy and the fact that they were, you know, looking at, oh, you know, we built we built so much to put down in the basement where we're having flooding now we need to raise where we put some of these mechanicals if that's part of the consideration especially since we're dealing with electric components um also we were question. talking yeah i don't know sorry <laughs> it's I, just I speculation I, do, I like i'm thinking i'm looking at the fema maps we do not have in our district we don't have anything that's in the a a e or a x no we're good for like <laughs> So, and I think our design flood elevation is very, very high. So for our district specifically, we might be able to get away with saying something like, you know, contextually, this is not something where we anticipate climate mitigated, you know, flooding or raising, rising sea levels or rising river levels is gonna impact us for another hundred years. The return on investment of batteries is like 30 years, do the math. Um, the other, so yeah, so again, these are citywide changes. So I don't know if they're, I'm sure they'll get into nuances when they look at neighborhoods. Um, the other item I'm, I am not 100% clear on, I thought I read somewhere that, because uh, I, I too was thinking solar panels would be great, would help to reduce cost for people in the buildings, but as a, you know, a small homeowner, yes, I could use the, um, I can use the power to defer some of my Cost, but residents in some of these residential apartment buildings, the landlord gets the benefit, but the residents in the building would not have lower power costs as a result of it because the, the, the power is going right back into the grid, not into their cost savings for the building itself is my understanding. So again, something yeah. that we need to do more research on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you could totally, yeah, that's that's true. I mean, there there should probably be guardrails on how, you know, if you're paying X amount for electricity and the electricity becomes cheaper because it's being produced on site, then that should be like reflected in the cost of any, you know, renters month to month billing. I think the other thing is like co-ops have been really successful in like around Flatbush specifically about trying to install solar panels because they make the collective purchase agreement to do it. So that that's kind of an in between, like single home buyer versus like you know sprawling multi. They're owned, complex. but they own the building, so they can exactly. do yeah, it. Yeah. A renter would not have that same benefit. Yeah, right. I see your point. That's a good point. Yeah, and that's part of the you know the the social justice part of this equation. Mm -hmm. It needs to be you know we're hopefully uh, get a higher level of equity or equitable distribution of these uh, systems for everyone. Uh, Nicola, did you have anything? No. Oh, okay. No, no. Uh, anybody? Anybody else have any comments? Nicholas, Teresa, Jay, Jay, get something to say. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention: is, is how many people here are from uh, 
East Flatbush, from the East Flatbush section of the district? Anybody? Anybody live close to Clarkson Avenue by Albany? Anybody here? Anybody live next to, okay. I just, just from a social justice standpoint, I just want to, just to say a lot of my, the information there's a, if you Google Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative, that has a lot of data on supportive housing. And there's, there's a flip, if, if you go and you, you ask people who are families, families in certain low income neighborhoods of color, what they think about an oversaturation of social services, they're, they're, they may give you a different opinion than somebody who isn't exactly in a neighborhood where they have an oversaturation of social services. So I'm not anti-housing. I, I, there was a guy when I had a property on Schenectady Avenue, I paid for his dinner every day. His name is Butch. And you can ask any of the ladies on the committee from that. I paid for his dinner every day for two years. So the, the issue is, is not uh, um, somebody who's anti-housing, it's oversaturation of social housing. Because I've been in touch with uh, Caribbean uh, block associations from the 58th Street Block Association in Community District 17. They're moving out because they've lived there and they say that they can't take the oversaturation of social services. And everybody wants to help people. You know, you want to help somebody. But if there's a, a tremendous amount, then that Jay, risk Jay, can, can I, I, can I so make I just a make that point to whoever says honesty and everything like that? Go ask black families and they could tell you what the theoretical, uh, you know, uh, ivory person in the ivory tower who says, oh, it's it's a great idea. OK, ask okay, let me let me let me make a recommendation. Think about reframe some of this into the context of a text amendment that you want to propose. Um, think about fair share law. This is something that should be raised with the housing committee. It's not fair share. Fair share in New York City is is really not a hard law. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this was something that Crown Heights found out when they put a homeless shelter on Rogers Avenue. Um, but it does exist. Look into the city's fair share law, raise right. it with the housing committee. Um, there may be occasion to raise it with the ULERP committee when things come before us as ULERP. Um, but as far as the city of yes subcommittee, think about whether this is something that could be framed as a text amendment that you want to propose, and then you know come come yeah. to us and, and let us know. Yeah, and just to tell you, you're, you're probably Suki, the only one who has the expertise who could actually figure something like this out because you did the uh, the demolition analysis where you said if it's a certain far, you, you can anticipate based upon a map where the uh, like different demolition may be for new building when you did that that map thing i think that you did with your husband and you created something that was fantastic before that you sent around but i'm, I'm just saying if to, to answer your question if they ever did a residential beds analysis and you then did it by census tract you could then figure out the difference of where it is and this whole thing is about increasing supportive housing and homelessness ho homeless housing which is not a bad thing my issue is just the oversaturation but that's in this proposal, and that's what the text amendment is going to be. That's my concern. Okay, thank you very much. And what I was responding to was a comment that was said before about let's not think about Republicans. I'm an independent, you know, but I'm just saying everybody has different ideas on how to do things. And I just hope people care about families and those who live in those neighborhoods uh, are the ones who speak up first for, get, uh, for it. Thank you. Um, okay, so the do we want to come up with a record? recommendation on battery storage. I mean, to me, it just it, it just seems like there is not enough information on the fire code, um, safety code. I, I mean, th th these these are this is a new thing, right? So what industry standards are there out there for safety? You know, as Andrew said, what about the load on roofs? Um, you know, what about fire, fire code standards for how these things should be housed or stored? Um, I, I would like to see that before we just go ahead and say it's all as of right under the zoning code. Right, maybe that, maybe that is already out there. I just, I just do not, not aware of that. Teresa. Yeah, I do know that um, the FDNY recently required these new type of rooftop railings if you're going to have solar 
which increase the expense of having solar on your roof by just this, just within the last few months by a considerable amount. And that the, um, cause we we're looking to put a solar on our roof. So we actually went very far with the step but decided not to because the expense was just, the change of expense in just a few months was extraordinary. And the, I think with the battery storage on the rooftops, there, there isn't really, there isn't, the tech isn't, isn't hot, isn't enough yet for, to be safe in my opinion and everything that I've read that maybe it'll happen. But I think, you know, we would refer to uh, at the NY and their expertise with that and what would happen. I think that just, as of right is not not a good idea. As much as I would like battery storage, upstate people are allowed to do that, but they they have um they have these sheds. My my husband actually worked for a company that did this design these sheds for storage, for battery storage. So if something were to happen, they would they have like a fire safety. So that that battery would be stored by itself in a little shed, these these sheds, and then it would put out the, the fire. So storing them on a house or in your basement is fairly dangerous unless there's the type of tech that you need for that hasn't been created yet, but it may be soon. Teresa, so that's, that's really interesting. I didn't I didn't know that you had actually designed something. Maybe you can um I, I didn't design it, but, but this there's companies that that design it, you know, for like in remote okay. locations like um where they need like the, the batteries, you know, they need, they need like fire. So houses, send us basically. more information. That would be great. So it's, it, we're John. not ready to have that yet. That's all. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. I was just looking at the city of yes, uh, the slides from the slideshow from October and the energy storage, the question about battery storage, uh, is that within a residential zone that is not an as a right permitted use. So it's it's not a, a building code issue. Right? We're, we're, we talk about a, you know zoning allowing it to happen and then also we're mixing in building code issues as well. Yes, those are all involved, but it's really it is simply a zoning question of whether that the the residential zoning code should be amended to as a right allow energy is called ESS, energy storage systems uh, within a residential zone. That's really all. And does it, the picture on the slide shows it on the top of the roof. And um, there's nothing within the text that says it's only refers to roof storage or basement storage or somewhere in the middle of the building. So it's really- I mean, my, my guess is that we don't want it in the residential area is kind of a stand in for we don't have any specific rules and regulations about this. And once we get the fire code and the building code and everything else, then it's easier, easy for them to say, of course, it's as of right, it's otherwise as of right in a residential zone. But I think at the moment, they're probably thinking of this as, well, we want all those nasty and dangerous activities to be in a commercial zone, right? Like, that's, that's kind of my take on it. Mm -hmm. But I thought they, I thought they were saying that they wanted this to be as of right now. They do. Currently, they it's do. not. They do. It's as, I don't know if it's as of right under a commercial zone, but Typically, when you see these things where it's not as of right under a residential zone, it has something to do with nuisance or or safe safety around people, you know, where people live. And um, so I, I would imagine that once the safety stand, the product safety standards, the fire code, the building code are in place, then, of course, it's easy to say, yes, it's as of right in a residential area, just like, a, you know any other type of, of, of energy device that you have in your home. But, but flipping that, that conversation there, Isuki, is if, if there's no building code in place to, that describes and allows this type of infrastructure to be put into a residential building, then you can't do it, right? You can't build something that the building code doesn't allow. So there, 
they're they're complementary in some way, if you want right. to think of it that way. But they're not. One doesn't exclude the other. I mean, currently it does. Because if it's if there's if you're allowed to build these in a commercial or manufacturing zone, there must be within the building code. I mean, I don't know because I haven't researched this. There must be requirements within the building code that would describe what you must do to create a safe enclosure or a safe environment for the rest of the building. Actually, that, that would be a great project if you want to look that up for us. I would John. love to, Suki. <laughs> okay. Um, so we'll maybe we'll take it up again next yeah. time. Um, but where we, we can leave it is, you know, we, we need to learn more about the the safety. Uh, Teresa. Teresa, did you have want to add anything? Teresa? No, no, no. I accidentally no? had okay. my hand left up from the fourth story. Okay, so next thing, um, rooftop solar. So what, again, I'm sure you guys are going to have a lot to say about this if you've considered solar or if you have solar, but some of the issues are that you have to leave a six foot clearance between the edge of the roof and your solar panels. Um, if your building is already over, it's um, FAR, which mine is, you know, I, I have a house that's an R2 zoning meaning that um, I can only build up to, to my, my house is, is already larger than the allowed FAR, but it was zoned that way after it was built um, to preserve the single family status. Um, but if that's the case, you can only cover 25% of your roof with solar panels, which as I'm sure most of you know, isn't really enough for it to be worthwhile. Um, so these rules, intend to eliminate that. Um, but the question again is, what are the fire department requirements? Because for example, this um, six foot clearance, I believe was a fire department requirement. And so what the Department of City Planning had to say about that was the fire department, we spoke to them and they, you know, are willing to relax these rules in certain cases, like they're less concerned if it's a low building. Um, you know, I don't know what exactly they talked to them about. It would be nice to know more details, um, but we, we certainly want to balance fire safety with being able to get enough panels on the roof. So any, anyone else? Teresa? Yeah. John? There, yeah, there are, I, I know this, unfortunately, all too well. <laughs> there are a number of FDNY restrictions and requirements that you have to allow front to back access. There's uh, fulls like, and that's six feet wide, six foot wide path left to right across the space. And again, you can't be within six feet of the front of the building you have to have a landing zone that's six by six for you know firefighters to get off of a, a bucket or off of a ladder so there's yeah there's there's lots and lots of requirements and there i'm not again i'm not 100 sure we did we chose not to put like an elevated canopy type style but i have seen those in the neighborhood within plg that seem to cover a good bit you know, much more than 25% of the roof. Yeah, they're, maybe they're some of them are not in compliance. That they just might not be. So, no, okay. they're, they're, they're in compliance. I've, I've actually talked to most of the people that have those roofs yeah. because that's exactly what we were considering. So mm -hmm. I went to their house, we talked to them at length, you know, trying to figure out what we wanted to do. So, and some of those roofs, what they are like not in compliance now, but when they were built, they were because these yeah. new, regulations have different types of, of railings and access. Like we have a situation where we could have quite a big one, but it's just the cost went up so much with the new FDNY regulations. Right. I think I think we should include some of those things that you're talking about, Teresa, in whatever we send to them. I'm going to include you on the chain of stuff that we have going back and forth. And I'm going to start putting together like a draft of things that we have to say about these uh, um, zoning for zero carbon and 
Yeah, it would be uh, great to have more solar roofs, you know, but it's it's really difficult to do. Yeah, we we found that for a flat roof, you know, we have two between the two skylights and the roof hatch and the six foot clearance requirement, we were hardly going to get anything. Nicola, we could get a we could get a pretty big one, but I guess my concern is if if the FDNY came up with these requirements, there's a reason for it. And so right. for now, City of Yes to decide, oh well, we want to kind of go around and overrule. Why? Why did FDNY come up with these requirements? And right. you know, what takes precedent? the developer and their needs or the safety of the residents in the building. Right. And and I think that it was a little, a little frustrating to me that city planning was very, really weren't, you know, they can't say what the fire department was willing to relax and, and why. I mean, you know, we've had fires on, on my block where, you know, people died in mm -hmm. houses. Mm -hmm. So. And as far as the bike batteries go, mostly all the batteries are not. Like, the, like I, there's only one type of battery and not very many bikes have it and it's much more expensive for the bike batteries so most batteries are not compliant with that one particular type it's called like l1 t1 something like that so most batteries aren't like that and they're not going to be because everybody is getting the cheap batteries you know right because that's what they can afford so yeah i, I mean so dangerous airbags and seat belts in cars are very expensive too um but they're now mandatory so you know it's a kind of a question of what what is a priority for the community well how many people are going to have to die you know before it changes or people have died in these i know i know three three children right uh, yeah were hurt last yesterday. Yeah, but um, you know, as John said, uh, you know, these batteries are really honestly everywhere. I, you know, they're they're in they're in electric vehicles too. You know, I um and and they can catch fire too, and they take a lot longer to put out. Um, but we don't ban them because ultimately there's there there has to be some kind of safety regulation that says when when we're satisfied enough that it's it's safe for you okay next thing um facades okay so um this one it was a little bit unclear to me basically in what what they want is for to be able to add more insulation to building facade to, to to you know to the building envelope to make it more airtight so you use less energy and to meet you know these lead standards and and passive house standards and so on and i'm sure most of you who are homeowners or who work with buildings you know that the traditional type of foam insulation is pretty thick so in a lot of new construction, the walls are very thick. They take up a lot of space. It's one of the reasons why a lot of people complain that new construction apartments are very tiny compared with the pre-wars because um, a lot of a lot of space is being taken up by walls, by mechanicals. Um, and so what they want is uh, to be able to have, and furthermore, what they're saying is that when you have an older building that's being retrofitted, um, to add insulation. Sometimes these buildings are already over their FAR, like kind of like what I was saying with my house. Um, so they, they're not allowed and adding insulation, which you know could could be quite thick, counts against that FAR. So they're not allowed to add it. Um, so 
it wasn't entirely clear to me. This is not my area of expertise. It seemed to me like what they're saying is there's already an exemption in the code for up to eight inches, right? So you, you can have, that's already a permitted obstruction. You can jut out up to eight inches beyond your um, building envelope. Um, but they want more. They want more. And um, so this is something that's a, um, you know, of concern. My, my, my first comment would be, should we not be pushing people to use the best available technology with, uh, like, I think it was like the Brooklyn, I, I don't know, Green Heating Council or something like that over in Park Slope. And I got some samples of a new material. It's like a very thin aerogel. I um, wish I'd uh, brought a sample with me, but um, maybe I'll show you guys at the regular ULERT meeting. But that's what it's called. It's called aerogel. And only a couple of centimeters thick, but it has as much R value as stuff, styrofoam stuff that you that you get from from Home Depot or whatever, but it's a specialty material. Not a lot of people use it, but it's intended specifically for retrofits of older buildings. And I think we should really be pushing people to use that technology instead of just blindly saying, we're, we're gonna give you more FAR because um, you're, you're too lazy to figure out what else to do. Um, the other thing I have to say is that, you know, even to the extent that using very thick insulation might be the only option. Um, it wasn't clear to me whether they were saying, uh, uh, you know, that they, that they just wanted, um, you know, uh, uh, just wanted to be able to have like a permitted obstruction going into a front yard or whatever. Um, or whether they were really saying, okay, we're going to add it to the inside, but we want to take extra FAR somewhere else to compensate, which I would really be, I, I think that's really unnecessary. I, I would be opposed to that. Um, and I, I don't think it's even really to the benefit of the people whose apartments are being retrofitted, right? Because you, you you're losing space inside your apartment and the developer is just, is getting space someplace else um, so that they can rent out another apartment to someone else. Uh, I also am really not keen to have really large permitted obstructions in side yards. I, on, on a lot of our blocks, I think the side yard requirements are already really skimpy. It's only eight feet. Um, so if you can imagine like two detached or semi-detached houses, both adding eight inch or more obstructions, you're going down from eight feet to six feet or five feet or whatever. Now there, you know, now you have egress problems if that was being used for something. I've, now you can't fit a car down it. Now maybe now you, you know, you can't fit a contractor's van down it or whatever. Um, so I'm particularly not keen to have it into side yards. I'm also really not keen to not have limits with front yards because one of, one of the things that the zoning code does in certain places is require the street walls of the buildings to be lined up. And I'm sure you've seen some of those new construction buildings that jut out, you know, in a way from the rest of the block, you know, even if it's five feet or whatever, it looks kind of terrible. And we have the zoning codes specifically to make sure that people don't do these things. So I, you know, I'm not sure that I, I want to give away that much, um, just because we put the word green on it. So that's my take on it. Anybody else? Anything? I, I agree. I mean, that was basically my concern as well. That we're based allowing the um, developer to now go beyond their, their lot lines and encroach on their neighbors, encroach on the sidewalks right. and shared space. Right. Um, all, I, I agree with the, you know, we need to retrofit and have green, but as you said, um, do we have to give up the FAR in order to do that? Mm -hmm. 
or can we use other materials to make sure that the building size stays intact? Yep. And yeah, you know, looking at again, looking at the city of yes, the slideshow, one of they show like a modern glass or a fairly modern glass uh, building where they're like adding thickness to that, you know, and encroaching or going beyond the the street wall. Uh, that might work and be like acceptable in again in a modern class type building. But you look around in here in, in CB9. You know, we have brick buildings, we have brownstone buildings, we have limestone yeah. buildings. I certainly don't want, you know, a block of these buildings now having new fronts built, you know, added onto them yeah. just because the insulate. So um, I'd rather like go inside the building and, you know, inject some foam or do something on the interior within the cavity. Even yeah. you may not get the full value that you could but let's not destroy our neighborhoods to, to save them in a way. Yeah, yeah. And particularly, it's a concern because of a lot of our neighborhood is not landmarked. Um, and, you know, even if we try, I don't think we're going to get 100% of it landmarked, but the buildings are still older. And my experience is, you know, when you start slapping these facade materials on top, it's actually not just an aesthetic issue, it's very damaging to the underlying structure. So like, you know, in the 70s, we had this issue as well, high energy prices, people wanted to make their buildings more um, energy efficient. And, you know, you'd have the uh, stucco salesmen coming down the block and, and you'll see like there's certain blocks that have this kind of multicolored like broken stone stucco on the outside. And we looked at, at actually buying a, one of these buildings and we decided not to because we were told that removing it would be incredibly expensive. And even if we managed it under underneath the brownstone or the brick might be severely damaged by this. And, and so I think that's that's something you know that the city really needs to, to think about as well is what are, what are really the best practices for these older buildings, even if they're not landmarked. Because one of the things that I was told is, is if you put a, a, a covering or cement or whatever that doesn't breathe on top of this older brick that it's going to end up spalling but you you really have to pay attention to the materials that you're using so that's i you know i i hope the city can start thinking about that any anybody anybody else Teresa Andrew Sorry, I would love to see this document. I'm so curious to know about this. I've worked on a few retrofits in New York City. Uh -huh. um, they've been they've been pretty big though, so they haven't been like at the scale of single family. I'm curious that they they let they let a change like that breach the lot line in a non conforming lot. Is that what you're saying? I. Uh, it it's it's really they yeah. really didn't give a lot of details yeah. on the code sections. I mean. Um, okay. It's not, yeah, you, know, you can't go over the lot line. That would be you're taking over someone else's property. You're not allowed to do that for anything. Okay. That's what uh, I thought. It's, it's, it's basically, it's if you had a side yard or a front yard setback requirement, or even, or I guess, a rear yard setback yeah. as well, you would be encroaching into that. So if you have a, again, most of Brownstone Brooklyn has like a 10 or 12 foot front yard requirement, you can now make that 11 feet rather than 12 feet because you take it over. Right. And I don't yeah. think it's such a big deal if you're going into the backyard by an extra foot or two when you have an, a 30 foot that, backyard. That's fire code but, though. but that's a fire code issue is that you had a 30 foot yard because there's, you know, we can't get equipment back there. It's hard to get firefighters back oh, there. Oh, the size Honestly. of the towers. Yeah. So, but they have a lot of permitted obstructions into backyards. It bugs me like, though with the side yard because the side yards are so small already. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the theoretically, if you had a detached garage in the back and you came in, you know, eight more inches, you may not be able to access that garage. So, or your ADU. Who knows? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Sorry, um, I think I'm missing an email chain. I would like to know, like, the PDF version. I'm having trouble finding, like, real. Andrew, can you? Um, they, I, they I, did... I emailed Mia last week. 
Okay, I I have I I don't Mia, can you can you send me J Andrew's Andrew's contact information? Yeah. Sorry. I'm so curious because like every time anyone ever suggests like an EIFS, like a, an exterior insulating finishing system, like right. those are immediately booed down because they're ugly and they're terrible for water retention. Um but I am curious whether they they managed gross or net that they are and like how they're able to negotiate that between bulk and height requirements that are overlaid on top of FAR limits. Um, Cause I, I think like an average, an average parcel in our district is 25 feet, right? That's the width of the average parcel. 20. 20? Yeah, yeah. No, no, because we have a lot of single family homes as well. Single families that are 25 plus. Yeah. yeah. Most so of, this, it, most of the homes kind of are attached in this district, mm -hmm. but there are definitely some detached homes. Yeah. They might actually be 30 or 40 feet. Or wide. 50 so, or somewhere is 50, like, 60 feet. I, I'm, I'm saying, is the retrofit potential going to get you an extra like whole number floor of FAR in these situations? No, I... Again, I'm, I'm reading the looking at the slide. It's really talks, talks only to buildings that are at or over the, their allowed FAR. FAR. So if you're under, like, again, most of you know, my most of our district is at or over though. Right. So the, mm, you guys no, well, your, most of our district is actually is under. well under, but yeah. they're like my my house. You know, the the single family district. We're mostly over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we're all landmarked anyway, so that's not going to, you know, nobody's doing that. <laughs> it's it's more kind of like, let's say, you know, one of the smaller buildings on the avenues, um, some of them are built extremely deep. Uh, I don't know. I, it might not come into play in, in, in our, in our just, no, I'm trying to, oh, you know who, you know who it would affect? Okay, there, there are a bunch of apartment buildings uh, like six story apartment buildings on Lincoln and Lefferts that are in R5 zoning. They're well, obviously, well over their FAR. Oh, I, I live in one of those. Yeah. Yes, that's me. Um, it's not going to get retrofitted <laughs> anytime soon. There's hell no. Like, no. You not, just not don't happening. have that kind of landlord. Yeah, absolutely not. But <laughs> hypothetically, Although um, with local law 97, this is something, this was yeah. uh, uh, another issue that came up, um, you know, so it's, that's not something we can really discuss under city of yes, but I definitely, it, it was something that was brought up by commissioner Benjamin and it's, it's really going to hit a lot of people, especially co-op buildings. I think rent stabilized buildings get an exemption um, they have the requirements are a lot less stringent for them. They just have to show that they sealed up air gaps and things like that. Yeah. Um, the co well, local on ninety seven gets stricter every every two or three years, right? Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. So I mean, like you're planning for today, and maybe we should be planning for like ten years down the line. Yeah. So I think you know if if the building doesn't have a big reserve fund and they they don't have the ability to raise maintenance significantly, it's going to be a it's going to be a concern. Um, so the other thing with regards to like there was a there was some discussion around giving incentives um, to developers for for green you know green retrofits and. Um, you know, I think the idea that we're going to give extra FAR for any anything we want, any social thing, whether it's fresh or affordable, you know, fresh food or affordable housing or or green stuff. I mean, it, it's kind of, to me, it's it's not appropriate in in all cases. It first of all doesn't always make that much of a difference, um, and sec second of all, you know, I I. It, I, I think a lot of New York City, the zoning is extremely permissive um, rather than being a very, very tight zoning envelope. So it's not it's not necessarily appropriate. Um, and it doesn't necessarily pay for all of these things. Um, and I think, you know, one of the commissioners brought up the fact that there are also a lot of 
uh, grants and tax incentives at the federal and state level coming to lower income communities to help pay for some of these green retrofits, which are going to be quite expensive if you wanted to completely electrify your house to have electric heating and stove and everything else, it's it's very expensive. Um, and uh, so yeah, we just we just got these um, tax incentives at the federal level. Um, there's also additional state incentives for certain low income communities and mental health communities. Um, so we probably need to look into whether our district qualifies for those. Um, uh, but you know, one of the things that I noticed when I was looking at these, these, these incentives are for equipment. And in terms of actually using like the mini splits or the compressors or whatever, um, it's reasonable. But the big cost in New York City is labor. It's the installation of these systems. Um, so I, I would have liked to see the city intervene on, um, you know, want to align, want to align our uh, green goals with the city's goals for workforce development. We could be um, subsidizing training for like a small army of people to learn how to install these new systems, whether it's solar rooftops or, you know, these new um, electric HVAC systems. Um, so I, you know, rather than just giving zoning incentives for everything, because that's our committee and, that, and that's what we can do, um, I feel that there are, are better tools that that are actually going to be more um, more beneficial. So I don't know if anyone else has anything to to say. Anybody? I agree. <laughs> so. So no, there's, yeah, there's, when we step back, we're talking about a multi-year, like almost a generational long time of renovation and retrofitting and upgrading of New York City's built environment. And that's going to take, a, it's a massive amount of money. It's a massive uh, amount of labor and labor techs and training that needs to happen and be maintained. And then these systems get installed, then you have to have people who know how to repair them and maintain them and upgrade them for the next 50 years after that. So now in 2050, which is probably a little bit too late, but um, yeah, we're when you're looking at 25 plus years of of work and there's a lot of people who are going to be needed to support this. And yeah, I don't think we can re rely on the, the free market to solve that question. Anybody, anybody else? Teresa? No, you've looked at doing some of this. Andrew, any any comments? No, nothing more to say. I would like to read it first. I, you know, nothing off the cuff. It's there's really not a lot there. It's very vague. Um, One is street trees. What they're saying here is right now, um, new developments require new street trees, um, but they're saying in cases where street trees are not possible, they wanna change the zoning code to make um, uh, rain gardens uh, an option. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, that sounds like a good thing. Uh, um, my only comment would be that uh, the purpose of street trees is not just um, stormwater retention, but also in areas that might um, be designated as urban heat islands, they can have a beneficial cooling effect. Um, 
I don't know what they mean by not possible to have a street tree, whether it's if it's because the, the sidewalk is just too narrow. Um, I'm not opposed to having a rain garden as an option, um, but I, I, I think we should probably look at things like whether our district um, has heat island areas. Um, I think the length of rain gardens can be an issue. You know, if you're trying to get out of a car and you have a rain garden that's like 10 feet long um, and you're parked at the curb, you know, I don't have a problem hopping over that that little railing or whatever, but you know, if you're 85, maybe maybe you do. Anybody else? Yes. Well, I don't know if rain gardens are always what you might think they are, because we talked about this in the EP committee and there were these designated rain gardens on a map. And I went and tried to look at these rain gardens, but they weren't really rain gardens. They were sort of underground you know, reservoirs for rain. There was nothing above ground at all for them. So Is it I a think permeable were, pavement? Similar, but it, it wasn't like any type of a garden. I mean, other rain garden, you know, it's, it's a bit confusing as to what I looked at and what we talked about in the committee and what mm -hmm. we were presented with, what was re what was actually happening in reality. So I'm not opposed to rain gardens, definitely. This, this area does have a lot of flooding. I mean, somebody was talking about that earlier, but many of our, uh, many people come to the uh, EP meetings and to the community board with flooding in this area. There's quite a bit of pooling of water and some of the new um, grates, the way that they've been installed by the DOT, they clog and they flood. And people have had, even on my block, you know, and w people have had their entire basements, like a gentleman in my neighborhood's a famous art sculptor artist, and his entire basement was flooded. The whole block on the other side, all these basements are flooded and some of it comes from the you know design of new buildings. I know that on Sterling they were having an issue with that where that new uh where like that 7-Eleven that that plaza was put in because of the way the buildings are designed the new buildings it causes flooding into the basements of the buildings and one of a person in uh lower Flatbush like northern Flatbush who's in our district they they're having like he has to go out when it rains and block the rain from coming down his driveway and flooding his whole house this is regular this is new because of these new designs and also because of the i guess additional flooding and we do not have the capacity to deal with flooding in this district it's way more widespread than you might suspect regardless of what you know maybe on a map and how we're designated I, many, I totally many agree, Teresa. It's, and it is on the DEP maps. It's it's on the DEP maps that we have areas of serious flood risk. So yeah, I agree. So that's that's definitely happening. So anything we can do to alleviate that, people and you know, basements are going to flood. People are going to lose their homes. So what's your take on um, kind of the street tree versus rain garden thing? I mean, I haven't really run, and any of you can speak to this as well. I haven't really run into issues where a developer said it wasn't possible to put in a new street tree. Um, I, I mean, I'm just trying to think of an example. Well, people I mean, I, don't like street, a lot of people about them extensively. So I don't know. I'd rather have a street tree, honestly, but I know a lot of people don't like them. So because of many, many reasons. So I, I don't know. I think maybe like sometimes the middle of the street, they could make a rain garden. I don't, I am, I'm not sure. Yeah. Jay? I, I just wanted to just add the point about once you have uh, more street trees, which, which is a fantastic thing, it brings shade, there might be another effect <clears throat> also, which is that the leaves, which go in the streets, if people don't uh, aren't vigilant, 
those are going to go in the drain and in the sewers. And that could lead to, uh, you know, more uh, back it, you know, backups and everything like that, because, you know, uh, you're going to get more leaves. And I, I, I had that issue on a property that I once owned in Canarsie, where you have all these beautiful trees and everything, but the sewers were all backed up when, uh, you know, Hurricane Sandy came. So the, I don't know if there's a way where the sewers can be done in a way to not have the leaves go in it, but it may be difficult if there's a sewer that's like on flat on the ground, that may be impossible. I don't know how it would be done to maybe some sort of way to, to prevent it, but there's just that issue of uh, cloggage, which would go to more flooding. Well, this is a good time to remind all of the property owners that you are supposed to collect bag and, and put out your leaves um, and street sweeping should should help with the um, with the leaves at the curb. I know everyone hates ASP, but that's one of the purposes of ASP is to allow street sweeping of things like leaves. I love ASP. <laughs> I, I, yeah, also well, clean. I hate that people don't with their damn cars. <laughs> Where's the... Me too. Yeah, the well the thing is is they don't they oftentimes just don't sweep. They just go down in the middle of the street and don't do it. I mean, yeah. we see that regularly That's a in our issue. area. And I've then, got the then number for my local district. They're all manager. covered and then they're all I'm that guy. I complain. Anybody have any thoughts about if we're going to have more rain about, about it? it? Wait, uh, Suki, I have a thought actually. Is it Andrew, possible yes. to say like we care about street trees and if there is actually genuinely no possible way that you could ever put a tree here, we would like you to then disaggregate the benefits of them. So on one hand, greenery, lushness, water retention is good. But on the other hand, we do realize the heat or uh, the urban heat island effect. So we would say like, oh, if you're going to not use street trees, we would recommend a green measure and a heat island reducing measure, like a, like a cool roof or you may be using high uh, HSR pavements on, on and around the building semi-permeable pavement like you could get really specific about like oh you don't want to do trees that's fine pick two okay does that make sense um, is that yeah. within your purview um, I, also re I recall ny uh, the sanitation department and dep working together after hurricane ida to put up a pilot program where they would go around and before storms like preemptively like try to declog drains i don't know if that was done in our area because like there hasn't been a huge storm to my memory since Ida. So one of my neighbors says that DEP used to go around every few years and basically with like this giant vacuum and clean out the drains. Uh, they just haven't done it in a while, apparently. Hmm. That's so that's a service question. issue to, to raise with the district manager. I, I would find out like what what the cleaning schedule is. Um, yeah. Anybody have any other thoughts about like the design of rain gardens or? Um, they become a maintenance issue because people don't maintain them. So they look, the plants die, they just collect trash and adjacent landowners don't participate in maintaining them. So there needs to be some engagement, I think, with the community at some at a level that would create these as, you know, explain what these are for and why they're good for the community and, and potentially with every neighborhood or establish a, you know, handful of people who will long volunteer to maintain and keep these upgraded on a well, it, regular basis. If these are being developed as part of an association with a new building, then wouldn't it be the developer or building management's responsibility to maintain those trees as well? It doesn't happen in, in some of the cases, but it should. That should be part of their preview. That if you're going to put this in place and these trees are being planted yeah. because yeah. of the cement and the yeah. No, that's that I 100% right. agree. But my understanding is that that is one of the flaws of the sweet tree requirement is that there's no aftercare requirement of that. You can yeah. have a tree, it can die in two years, and like I don't have to replace the tree. 
And then isn't the city, the city responsible for street trees? Once isn't parks responsible for street they trees? They are. Yeah. There's like a ten year wait list. Yes. Well, they're going they around now planting trees because they stuck a few on our block. They sure and they, Yeah, we've got a lot of new trees. They they have an initiative going on now. Yeah. But then they say they'll maintain for two years and then it's up to the block. <laughs> the, oh, the that, that's not here. true. That they're they're res I mean, they they, we were they want you to take care of it, but they're legally responsible when it's a street tree. I mean, you're not going to be allowed to like chop off the branches or anything. So they're legally responsible. I don't know that that's. You know, they don't. Yes and no. But I mean, they we, had to, we, had to, we had to go around and clip off some of the, do some pruning on some of the trees in our block. I mean, we've been told we're not allowed to do that because it's, it's a city tree or. Technically, whatever. you had to be certified as an. Yeah, you have to get pruner. it. Yes, there is you a have way to get to, a person. Yeah, there is a program to do it. Through, I think uh, the Botanic Garden runs has options too. Mm hmm. Okay, so I think the right way to handle this is there's a lot of material here. I'm going to write up like a, um, a summary of some of the things that we've talked about in terms of questions and recommendations and send it around um, so that we can, you know, look at it, add stuff to it. I think some of you have a significant amount of material or significant amount of experience working on some of these things. Um, so I would love if you could contribute that. Um, and then uh, we'll see if we can can get together a document before the ULERT meeting. Um, question before we go, did we talk about the charging stations? Oh, okay, yes, yes, okay, sorry. Um, so uh, for EVs, um, this, this, amendment was particularly vague and maybe it's just because I'm not really familiar with the parts of the code that apply to it but what they were saying is there are some parts of the zoning code that limit the number of charging stations that can be placed in commercial locations or garages and so they want to remove those limitations um and uh to go along with this, the city council at the end of January um, had a hearing about a proposed bill. I think it was introduced um, by council member Brannon um, to require that 40% of the available parking spaces in a commercial public garage or um, uh, public parking lot be um, uh, have be be capable of having uh, electric vehicle chargers installed by I think 2030. Um, so obviously, if this does get passed by the city council, if there are any zoning impediments, those would need to be removed. Um, does does anybody is anybody familiar with the part of the code that deals with it? John, Andrew, do you guys know? Um, I I don't know. Again, that's a very I could add it to my my battery storage. Okay. List. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a very I mean it's new technology or new need or demand. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I think the bigger question, um, and it's probably a, more of a Euler uh, question, is that the city has installed a, like uh, as a starter program or a pilot program to have dedicated uh, electric vehicle charging at the curb. So there, these are parking spaces which are now dedicated and in theory can only be used by drivers with an electric vehicle. So I think that's a huge yeah. step in probably a negative direction where you now have are giving public space dedicated solely to a very, you know, currently a very small number of, of people. And e even if in the future, if you think that, you know, 80% in 
15 years, 80% of the cars will be electric powered. Um, is that something we really want to do, you know, for free, you know, give over a public good to, again, a number of people for free. So, I think that's and, and the keep, bigger issue. In, in line with your discussion, John, I have a pet peeve with the, the same parking spaces that are now dedicated to, um, the share drive, the share cars, um, zip cars. Mm -hmm. It's very similar. Don't get me started on city bikes. Like when did when did we give permission to give up our parking space, our public space, for these private entities? Right, but the I know it's, if um, you know the history of parking in New York City, it wasn't until the mid to late fifties that you were allowed to park your car overnight on the street. Okay, so Probably. these discussions aren't really um, part yeah, of totally relevant. Yes, uh, I do think that franchise, as I said before, franchises do fall under ULERP. I think that's what the borough president told us last time, and quite pot. And I, I do think that these contracts charging with the city are franchises. And I would for that, so I would definitely bring this discussion to the regular ULERP committee meeting. Um, uh, but but you so kindly volunteered to look up the code for us relating to City of Yes. Um, so we can we can talk about that next time. Um, and it's it's 917. Uh, is it, does anybody else want to oh oh my gosh. So I was gonna um, talk to you about just review uh where you know it, it kind of going back to the zoning for housing opportunity to talk about you, you know th this zoning for housing opportunity is about where can we build more housing but i think it's very important to have the perspective of what's been built already and where it's been built so we the borough president's office did some work on it um the data had some problems particularly with our district so uh, my husband and I did our own map um, based on this a city city databases of where new construction was happening um, really around the city because once you download the database you can do the whole city um, and uh, so we have that uh, and I know I've been promising to send that out for a while uh, but we've been working on it um, getting the website up. So that website is nyczoning.org. Um, so we have that map. We also have the City of Yes map up where we showed where the demolitions could take place. Um, keep in mind, this is a work in progress. Um, if you find it clunky or difficult to use or there's anything you don't understand, feel free to let me know. Um, uh, but I'll, I'll just say, you, you know, and I think the maps kind of speak for themselves, but I'll just say this in passing. It is very clear in Brooklyn, and I think in most of the other districts as well, that most community districts have built a lot in the last 10 years, thousands of units. I think in our district, the number was something like 3,600. Um, that's, we're kind of in the middle for Brooklyn. Um, some districts like uh, Williamsburg and Greenpoint have built a lot. I mean, we're talking like close to 20,000 units. Uh, and there are a handful of districts in every borough that really haven't built a lot at all. And there are reasons for that. Um, sometimes, usually it's because they're simply not zoned to allow any development at all, you know, as I, kind of noted before you have districts that are zoned r1 through r4 and they're they're not going to see any any development um and there are certainly areas in our district that are like that i obviously live in one of them it's single family by by covenant so that's not going to change um but but there are entire districts that are are zoned that way um and so i think it's it's quite clear that most of the city is building a ton and there are a handful of districts that are really not building anything much um and there might be good reasons for that you know i wouldn't want to speak for anybody else's district 
but you guys can take a look at the website. Anyway, um, anybody else have anything to add before we adjourn? Any other business? Jay? Yeah, just an idea. Uh, maybe in the future, uh, um, there could be a, a program on DCAS, how it works and everything like that for the regular ULERP committee. Just wanted to mention that. Are to you see. coming to the regular ULERP meeting? Sure. Because Unella asked us about some of these, um, a DCAS related issue related to 777 Rutland Road. Okay. Um, Sounds great. I'll, I'll come. I'm not that should be raised, you know, that we should know what, uh, whether or not they've made any decisions on that. Right. Because there's a whole process with DCAS. It's it's almost like ULERP, you know, and, so and come, just come to the regular ULERP meeting. Oh, well, great. Thank you, Sigrid. Thank All right. you. Uh, but I, I'm I'm putting my Pat and Warren hat on. Is okay. this ULERP or is this a housing thing? Because is this something that the ULERP committee would then be reviewing and voting on? I'm I'm just trying yeah, to understand. It actually came before us as a rezoning request. Right. Um, but before they could even enter the ULERP process, they needed a deed restriction lifted by DCAS. And so DCAS is supposed to inform the community board about whether or not that has happened okay deed restricted oh, okay because it's um it's a property that had been designated that it needs to be supportive housing or a shelter no, or something along those lines the deed, the deed restriction it was deed restricted to community facility uses and they okay. want it was, it was a church and they wanted to rezone it to permit housing Oh, that's and they okay. wanted an upzoning. They wanted a massive upzoning. Yeah, yeah. I know. I know the project you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? A any other business, Nicholas? I haven't heard from you all night. Well, I've been listening because I was doing double duty because I was uh, at the. Council Woman Town Hall. So I was. I know. I know. I was really bummed. I didn't get to go. Right. So, uh, but uh, I've been listening quite intently. But the only thing I wanted to bring up, and this is something I spoke to Yunella about it regarding all those construction taking part on the eastern part of the district. Does you help us to deal with? uh amenities like parks community centers that this building are coming to because that's the thing i was concerned about this is a side of this community but that doesn't have any of this there's hardly any parks there's hardly any places for young people to gather any creative facility for them to to do so i wanted to know as part of their the building can the community board act same way you have for certain number of community number of uh, what you call it, uh, low, uh, uh, affordable housing, should they be also a request to have parks, auditoriums, creative spaces for young people in the uh, as this building are coming up? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I believe that some of these developments like 681 Clarkson, had open space as part of the development and they have space for nonprofits, but it's it's not clear that this is kind of like whether or not this is open to all community nonprofits or it's going to only be offices for the organizations that are kind of, are managing these buildings. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was addressed at, at the meetings, I think, for uh Clarkson Estates and also mm -hmm. for Kingsborough West but more to your point generally about whether we should have more parks or other um amenities in this this part of the district th this is one of the reasons I think it's very important to have a holistic land use planning process where we're even though this is not a city or application, we're recognizing the number of units that are coming in. We're recognizing, you know, the density that exists already in our district, and we're asking what we're missing. I know one of the things that I've 
highlighted with this area is that sanitation garage that, you know, the trucks are out on the street. It's disgraceful. Um, so I, I, I think that the way that we obviously, you know, as you know, the budget process is, is one part of where we raise this, but I think that if we can take kind of a comprehensive land use planning look at our district and what we need, um, you know, that that would be that would be very helpful. So if you're coming again, if you're coming to regular ULERP, um, you know, please raise this, please raise this issue. I sure will. I sure will, because this is something that came to my mind. And then I know Jay was, oh, it was one person was really talking about those things. I don't know, have anybody seen the plans yet? And I wanted to know if any of these uh, community center type activities, gym, swimming pool, and all the stuff are part. Yeah, originally Diana Richardson promised that SUNY Downstate would open their pool, but I haven't heard anything about that since. Right. So, okay. So I'll bring it up at the next year. Definitely, definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, Jay, anything, any last words? Yeah, just to, uh, any last words? I, I hope you're not going to kill me, Suki. Uh, no, but it's 927. So right. I'm going to give you three minutes. <laughs> you should kill me, though. Um, just, just very quickly, uh, out, Mr. Almanar, there, there are a lot of, at 681, there are a lot of uh, non-building uh, 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 businesses that are going to come in to 681 to benefit the community. Uh, okay. it, it's going to be a uh, like ballet for uh, ballet for whoever wants to go to the ballet. Stuff mm -hmm. learning how to dance. They're going to have that. There's going to be a supermarket. There's uh, some, some stuff on uh, for uh, people from uh, um, uh, justice provisions, like uh, who went through the jails. Uh, there's going to be stuff to benefit them. There, there's a lot of things that do be, a lot of good community uh, programs there. Uh, I think it's around 33,000 uh, commercial square feet. So there's, there's a lot of businesses, thir around 33,000 square feet that are going to be a lot of uh, good things that uh, are attached to uh, that project. Okay. Uh, any basketball course or anything like that? Uh, oh, no. Outdoor spaces? None. Uh, uh, basketball courts, I would say no. Uh, there's going to be a supermarket uh, uh, that's going to be there. There's also going to be a supermarket uh, on the east end. There'll be two of them. Uh, one at uh, on the 681 Clarkson and uh, at, at uh, Kingsbrook at Utica Crescent, which is on Utica. Uh, and and uh, Rutland. And Rutland, thank you. They're going to have a supermarket there too. So okay. two, two more supermarkets. All right. Looking at the totality of Trump's conduct over the years, I thought it was crystal Okay, um, so it's 929. Uh, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Do I have a second? Indeed, the more successful... Second. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, we will be in touch by email. And Andrew, make sure that Mia... Uh, sends sends me your your email contact. All right. Both do. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone, for staying this long and good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Criminal activity to increase an entity's economic power. Good night. Good night.